our uh, our uh, study today is about the compelled by the love of Christ. So let me ask everyone to stand up and uh, please read with me our scriptures for this morning. Let me start reading. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one died all for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. May the Lord add blessing upon reading of his word. Please sit down. Let me pray. Father, we are so thankful because on another day that you have given us, not just to sit down, but to listen to your word and be sensitive that you are talking to us. Lord, I just pray, Father, that this message that we will hear, and I, I pray, Father, that you will touch every heart and that you will bring sensitivity uh, to be more conscious why we are here on this Sunday, worshiping and giving thanks to you. So, Lord, here we are. We humble ourselves before you as we, uh, as we listen and be blessed through the message that we will hear this morning. So this I pray in the name of your son. Amen. So there was a story. I don't know. It's not a story. It really happened in, in the television show. I don't know if you know Ryan Reynolds, uh, Deadpool, uh, what else, Green Lantern. So all of you who are young and probably saw this Avenger. Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, Marvel. <laughs> not a, he's not an Avenger. But here, he was being interviewed by David Letterman in the late show, late night show. And... And he was, so, he was asked about his wife. And David Letterman is like, how much do you love your wife? And this is what Ryan Reynolds said. And I quote, okay? It's not from me. This is from Ryan, uh, Ryan Le Reynolds. I love my wife. And I will do anything to protect my wife as a shield from any bullet. But the moment I saw my newborn daughter, my newborn daughter's eyes, oh, I know exactly what to do when, I, when, they, when we are being attacked. I will use my wife as a human shield to protect this baby. <laughs> what, a change of, what a change of love, right? In the beginning, he was so... You know, he really loves his wife. And all of a sudden, when he, he saw the eyes of his daughter, love changed. Uh, that's not true. It's a joke, I'm sure. But here, we will go back now uh, from the topic that uh, Bishop Jerry started two weeks ago. This is about the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 5. And again, this is the, part, the second part of the series that we're we're studying. And before I would like to continue, I would like also to do a recap of what we have learned two weeks ago in regards to the message that Pastor or Bishop Jerry gave us. Okay, this is about Paul defending, defending his ministry and his integrity from Paul's teachers. These teachers were leading the church from the truth and discrediting him or his integrity or his motive to the believers of Corinth Church. But this is not just about Paul. This is for every Christian minister or every Christian or every believer that we have to defend our faith and motive. And we should always be conscious how to live a life that's blameless and trustworthy of God's calling and purpose in our life. So in this letter of Paul, he explained how he guarded himself from the false accusations and lies. And here are the things that can destroy his ministry, and, our, and I'm sure every minister's. So we have to be very careful. 
the first one is, of course, obviously, is sin. Right? That's the number one destroyer of your, our ministry if we committed the sin. The second one is the false accusation. So with this, you can definitely lose your integrity and credibility. Because the moment you lose your credibility, your ministry will be affected. And you lose the trust of people. That is why Paul is concerned. He's not really concerned about himself. But he is concerned about the church. And you can see this in, in the chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. He's concerned about the unity of the church. He's concerned about the reverence for the Lord. He is reverence for, to the Lord. His devotion to the truth, to what he's teaching. And of course, he wants to com complete the task that the Lord gave him, uh, giving him as a, Christ, as a Christ servant. So in this letter, he personally shared his motive and his heart to convince the church of Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 11, he even said, our heart is open wide. So this is very personal to Paul. He's telling people and trying to convince people, this is my, I'm opening my heart to you. I want you to see my heart. It's not just what I, I'm doing here. This is me. This is my life. That's why... The some commentators saying that, that the explanation of that Second Corinthians is 6.11, and this is what it's, they said. My heart is wide open. I'm just staring back everything so you can see exactly what's in my heart. There's nothing deceptive there. I just want to open myself up to you, and you need to just look at it and see the integrity of my life. That is what Paul is saying in Second Corinthians chapter 6. And this, that is what he's feeling. Trying to defend himself, not because of himself, but because of the concern about the church. He was also being accused of being proud because of the way he presented the, the word of God to the people. Because he is so, that's why he was labeled proud, fanatic, insane, crazy. And let's look at uh, verse 13. He said, if we are beside ourselves, it is from God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. So why? Here's the explanation from some of the theologians. Because he is speaking and teaching the truth. And it is because of the word of a living God. So if he is teaching calmly, because he was just trying to be patient to the Corinthian church to learn God's word. But in all this, Paul's fundamental motive is not about his honor. It's not about his reputation, but compelled to the love of Christ. Paul said, Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So, but we will talk about that later on at the end of the message. So the reason why we did the recap is for us to be reminded, because it's been two weeks. I know some of you for, probably forgot what we have talked about uh, last two weeks ago. But this is something that we can be reminded and set, it's kind of set a structure to support the letter of Paul or the study that we will do today until the, the next two weeks, I, will, I believe. So again, he, he was accused of being proud, right? And uh, b because of that, he's trying to defend himself. Now let's now continue to how he is compelled with the love of Christ. In, in what ground? So let's look at first the definition of compelled. It says in Google, it is to drive or urge forcefully or irresistibly or having to do something because you are forced to or feel it, it is necessary. Like what the, you know, the, the, the worship team is saying, doesn't make any sense. I have to do it. I can't resist. 
that love of Christ, I have to do something for him. And another explanation or definition, an inner feeling that irresistible to do and pursue. This is what the feeling of Paul when he was sharing it, when he was writing it to the, to the, to the Corinthians. So there are three things that, uh, that, that Paul is teaching us here through this letter. Three elements. And this is through his experience, his motivation, and his comp that he is compelled in serving God. And I'm sure this will help us also in our walk with Christ. And that, that, that is just to understand why we should be grateful to our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. The, wall, the way Paul demonstrated in his letter. Well, let's start with number one. Christ's love for us. For the love of Christ controls us. Paul means that, and of course, for all believers, this is an essence of Christ's love at the cross. In, in Paul's, you know, feeling and idea of that particular love because of he, he, he knows that it already happened. So he, he is thinking that this is the, he is Christ dying for him on the cross. Christ's love, Christ's love that motivated Paul, and of course that will driven him to be great, grateful, to give his gratitude to the Lord. It's not just that because it's all included, you know, forgiving is included in that particular love also. So he was saying that because of this love, he is constrained. He is compelled. He is pressured. He is driven. He is motivated by the, by the love of Christ. You're going to hear me talking about this overwhelmed, compelled, and because this is, this is what Paul is saying. You will see that in his writing as well. So why, 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 what, what is that love that he is so compelled? What are the qualities of this love, right? Let's, let's look at it. The first one, letter A, unbreakable love. In Romans chapter 8, 38, 39, he said, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from what? From the love of God. In Christ. This is our Lord. Nothing can change. His love. It's unbreakable. No matter what we, we do, because we know we are still sinners. We only became righteous because of what Christ did on the cross. The positioning of our righteousness is from, from when we are sinners in the eyes of God. Before we receive Christ, we are sinners. But the moment we receive Christ, we became righteous in the eyes of God. That position changed. So no matter how we do things in life as a Christian, and I hope we should not, we should continue to do what is right and righteous to the Lord. But... But here, the scripture is saying it's so clear, whatever you do, that love will not break. Well, human easily break. I don't know if you remember this fiction story of Romeo and Juliet. Do you know, I, I was just reading it, not the entire book. I, I was reading it, and, Paul, uh, and Romeo was really into this girl, Rosie or Rosalinda, I, I, I don't remember the girlfriend <laughs> of Romeo. So, he, he, you know, it was, they, according to the story, according to the book, that this guy, Romeo, was really like overwhelmed that, that because of his love to Ros, Rosie or Rosalinda. But the moment he saw Juliet, <laughs> his love changed. Now he's now towards Juliet. I didn't know that that was the story. I thought it was Juliet all the all the all the long, you know. But this is the love of God that is so unbreakable. And we should not, you know. I'm not saying we should do what we can do whatever we want to do, because His love will never change anyway. No. 
There should be a transformation because of this love. The second one is voluntarily love. Voluntary love. In Galatians chapter 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So the context is Paul is saying that the love of Christ over me was voluntary. You remember that Jesus said himself, John 10, 18, he said, No man takes my life from me. I lay it down by myself. Paul is saying that the Lord Jesus delivered himself for nobody. Up for, up, I mean, Jesus delivered himself up for me, for Saul, and for Paul, for us. And nobody captures him. He gave himself up. I remember uh, you will say, oh, well, he was captured in the gardens of, uh, right? He was arrested. But I remember when Pilate was asking him, why are you not ask, Why are you not answering all my questions? And Pilate said, do you know that I have the power to release you and crucify you? That was the Pilate was asking, saying to Jesus. You know what Jesus said? You have no power over me. It is only the power that's coming from heaven that whatever you do, if it is allowed in heaven, it's good. That is voluntarily. He gave himself up for you and me. That's overwhelmed Paul. That is somehow unthinkable. That is the kind of love overwhelmed him because he knew his own weaknesses, and he knew his own sinfulness, and beyond that, Christ would voluntarily give himself because of his love. He gave up his life for him. The third one is incomprehensible love. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge beyond the capability of human reasonings and experience. That is the kind of love that Jesus Christ gave you and me. You can never understand it, believe me. I tried. <laughs> Nobody can understand it. When was the last time you loved your enemy? I'm sure if you love them, you give them something. If you know that they have diabetes, you will give them something sweet all the time. <laughs> right? Because you love them so much, you want them gone. <laughs> It's incomprehensible. We cannot understand it. This is what Paul is feeling at that moment when he was writing it. Because he knew that he is the enemy of God. In Romans 5.10, he even said that in, in his, one of his letters to the Romans. Because this is not just about knowing God. This is about also loving God. Now, let's go to the, 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 the other part of, you know, that love, you know, that Christ loves us and it controls us. Let's go to that. That is the love Paul says that he even, con that particular love is controlling him, us. In the Greek word, this, they call it syneko or syneche. Syn but the, the, the simplest meaning is pressure that causes action. And it can mean restrain and constrain. Persuade to do something that influences us or intimidate us. And he's also simply saying that he is pressured by this love that Christ has, done for him, has given for him. And out of that gratitude, he said, I want to give him back everything I have to offer. And I want to give him back my life and my ministry as an act of worship. There you go. That's control. The control to do and follow what Christ wants us to do 
while we are still on earth. That's the reason why he wants to defend his ministry. He's saying, if I lose my ministry, there's no way for me to express my gratitude to the Lord. That's why he's so compelled. That's why he's so expressive of what he has learned from, from Christ. An amazing love. This is why he, Christ loves and endures for all of us. That will lead us to the second point. Is Christ did not just love us, but he also died for us. Oh, wow. Now we're talking about second level of love. This is no longer, this is no longer feeling. Well, I love you, but I'm not going to do anything from you for you. It's all just, you know, uh, I would say communication, but no action. But here, in verse 14, the one has died for all, therefore, all have died. So the love of Christ means his love for us is a sin as a, what? A sacrificial death. He loved us when we know we are unlovely. He loved us when we know we are ungodly, sinners, and enemies. He died for us. So when he died on the cross, you know what, God, or what Christ proved? He proved that he, his love for the world. Remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish. Again, the picture of Christ's love now went higher. The level of this, this love now you can see in action that Christ did on the cross. And Paul understood it so well. Jesus did this out of love and obedience also to the Father, whom he loved. So let's start with, you know, the, the, the one has died for all. You remember in the Old Testament, we all know that thousands of animals has been slaughtered and killed for sacrifice, right? They were basically being used to offer as an animal sacrifice for what? For one person. So, for example, if you commit sin today, you have to offer a dove or whatever. I don't know the, the technicalities of that, but I'm sure whenever you committed sin, you have to make an offering, a sacrificial, uh, an animal to offer for, for your forgiveness of your sins. So if a person committed sin every day, definitely he will have to make sacrifices every day. Many animals will be killed. And that was the time of, in the Old Testament. But now, Christ has one dying for all. We, all don't, we don't need to go get doves and, or else it will be messy here. We will need, that, we need more, I think I would say we need 100 custodians just to clean the church. Imagine that, right? But here, Jesus died for all. That's what he's saying. He died for all. That really overwhelmed Paul again. He is now getting to the point, no way. No way, man. Maybe if, if he will be talking now, it will talk, sound like that. No way, man. Because it's true. We should have the same feeling. Right? No way. Why will, come on. Why will he die for me? I'm crazy. I am I'm, I'm nothing. I have done a lot of things. And now Christ who wants to give his life voluntarily never changed his love for me. Now he's willing to die for me. Wow, no way. So there you go. One Christ died for all. And he knew he was part of that all. Paul understand and amazed that this death is powerful. 
Don't believe in that. His death is powerful. And that's why it put more pressure to him to serve. To, to give more gr gratitude to a God who died for him. For definitely he's overwhelmed. Because he's not just that it was like while he was a sinner, Christ was bearing his sins on the cross. For those people who don't know Paul, remember Paul is a murderer. He is the one who authorized to kill Stephen. He is the one who persecute Christian. He is a, a persecutor of Christian. He is a Pharisee. He is mean. That's who he is. That's why he probably he is so amazed. Like no way, I have done so many things against you, and now you are even using me to glorify you. And here, while he was still a sinner, Christ was bearing his sins on the cross for all of us. Galatians 3, chapter 13. He was made a curse for us. Definitely a mind-blowing. The theologians call this the doctrine of substitution. Paul is absolutely compelled that while he was a sinner, he died. And when he died, he died for his sin. Jesus did not die because he wants to be a martyr. He did not die just to show a high level of ethics. Or he did not die to show how devoted he is from God the Father. <laughs> you know why he died? He died, Christ died as a substitute for us. The theologian call it a propitiation to satisfy the judgments of our sins. We are all sinners. We're all going to die. And for Christ to do that, to ease the anger of God towards all of us. What he did on the cross is to satisfy, satisfy the wrath of God. And it's not just satisfied. It's a perfect sacrificial in our, for you and me. And we all know because of our sins, we will die, right? We will all be judged and condemned. But Paul is saying here that all died, all died are those people who died in Christ. Because not everyone died in Christ. I was asking my wife, what's that, that the English word for sana all? <laughs> I hope that Christ did die for everyone, right? But that's not the case. And we wish that, imagine that. If that's the case, oh man, we need a bigger building, right? We need a bigger building. This is not enough. If God, if God really died, for all, we need more space. It's not. According to the Bible, according to Paul, only those people who died in Christ. That's why he said, therefore, all died. Because you can, you can see how this was, uh, he said, that one has died for all, therefore, all have died. There's a therefore, all have died. So he was saying that not everyone died for Christ. And that's what we wish for. So the atonement can only be real substitution for those who died in Christ. Therefore, all died. In that verse, it's all for who died in Christ. And for everyone to whom, for whom Christ was the substitute. So the atonement is limited. But I believe, I believe that Christ is the savior of the whole world. A human. And I know that and believe in, in, my, in my heart that his work on the cross is sufficient. 
to secure the salvation to all. But there's a but. But not to all. Because it's only to those all who put their faith in him. This is what overwhelmed Paul again. This should overwhelm even all of us. Because while we are still in, on earth, now we are here. He died for us for all our sins. Or else, what happened if there's no substitution? There's no Savior. Every one of us will go to where we should go. You know where it is, right? Hell. So this was compelled and motivates him more and more because he knew deep in his heart that he's not worthy of Christ dying for him. Because if he would just look back, he, maybe he was just looking back of what he has done during the time that when he was persecuting the Christians. He was on the way to Damascus, right? And then he met Jesus Christ on the road. So now let's look at the next verse, and that will lead us to the next point after this part. Not everyone died in Christ, only those who put their faith in him. You all agree with that? Well, again, this is a, st a tough study, but I know someday the clarity of all this will be presented to us in the presence of the Lord. Now, this will direct us to our third point, right? Romans chapter 6, verse 5. If we have been united with him in death, like his, we shall certainly be united with him in resurrection. Wow. This is very clear that we died with him and now we are being raised with him. All believers will join Christ in his death and resurrection. When you come to Jesus Christ, God accepts you because you re we repent and we believe. That is a requirement. A sufficient atonement had been made for our sins, and that is the Christ died for us as a substitute. And he bore our sin on the cross. Therefore, we died with him. So now, let's go to the third point. Christ raised with us that those who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him who for their sake died and was raised. So this is basically uh, Building up the foundation of that second part. That Christ died for all and all have died. On the part of, the, of verse 15, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. This is a positive aspect of an identification with Christ. All of us can identify on this. We did not only die with Christ, but also Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newest of life. Romans chapter 6, 4. Because when we die, when, when we have died with Christ, you know what happened? We overcome, overcome sins. And because we live, with Christ, and we can bear fruit now for God's glory. Imagine that. Before we, you know, if you can see your life, before you are a wasted life, because we know you're going to, to that part of, now you, God is all, have now given you a, a, an opportunity to serve him, to, to, to be transformed at the same time to be an encouragement, and to be used by him to spread the gospel. To tell him the good news. 
to tell others the good news, to tell them that God is so good. This is what, what this Paul is trying to tell us here. That's why he's the reason why Paul depends his integrity out of desire for righteousness from Christ and resurrection. Because Christ did not die only, only I mean, Christ did not only die for us. He, he says, if we die in him, he also will rose against, again for us. And we will rose with him. But Paul is saying, death is not permanent. We all know that, right? That, that's love. I love to hear that. But we're not going to die forever. So one day we will all be with Christ in the presence of Christ. So he said, he died for all that they who have, been, have died in him and now live. Jesus died and rose again on our behalf. Again, I will say that we are. He is the substitute. We're supposed to be on that cross being crucified. Now he's not just remove us from that, that difficulties. He also places us in the nice place that, he will be, that we will raise, uh, uh, raise with him. In Romans chapter 8, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. There you go, again, and again, and again. He keeps saying that, that we will rise with Christ. If for those people who believe and have faith with him, will die and also rise with him. That's the context. Paul's believed, and all believers should believe that. Because someday, all believers will live in the presence of Christ. For what? For eternity. And those who have died in Christ, and that is true to all believers. So we will join Christ. And right now, we are already enjoying the life that he has given us. But we have to use that life for his glory. We have to be compelled on what Paul is saying, because he is compelled. Romans 6, chapter 10 for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now, he is saying that I'm no longer living for myself. He's now living for God. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Now he's more excited. Now he's more like, you know, hey, I'm going to do everything for the Lord. So that's the wonderful words of salvation. And that's Christian theology. Jesus died for our transgressions, but we're supposed to be on the cross. He became the substitute for our punishment. John MacArthur said, I like this, when he said, without the resurrection, the cross means nothing. For it has no validation. It has no vindication. It has no affirmation. But God raised Jesus from the dead. He was affirming and validating and big vindicating the fact that he had indeed borne our sins in his own body on the cross and had satisfied the justice of God with his, with his sin bearing. He's saying without the resurrection, the cross is meaningless. Just another death. So our sin... Our dying in Christ was not only dying to sin, but it was a resurrection and righteousness. Because now that we're alive in Christ, we have a new nature, a new life. And also the Spirit dwells in us. So we don't live for ourselves, but for Christ who died on our behalf. Again, he died, he rose, became a substitute for our punishment. And this is definitely... Amazed, Paul, am, uh, truly amazed of what's going on with that kind of love that he received from Christ. But this is not done. He said, if we, we know that, if we have that, we should live righteously. It's not something magical that all of a sudden you'll be like so good. No, it's not. 
there's an intentionality part here. That we, that's the reason why maybe I was thinking driving here, maybe Paul is thinking it's like every time he, he will wake up in the morning, he will just so compelled that Christ you died for me. You know, he was just so thankful. I know I'm not living for myself. This is, I'm doing this for you. Because you live in me. <laughs> in Acts chapter 24, he said, it doesn't matter what happens to me. No more. I don't care about my life. All that matters is that I do what God has committed me to do. That's all that matters. That because Christ lives in him. He keeps saying that Christ is in us. He's living in us. So there should be transformation. He said for me to live is, for me to live is what? To live, to live. In Christ, to, to live is Christ and to die is gain in Philippians chapter 1. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what matters to Paul is his God's will, God's purpose, God's goal, God's glory, God's honor, and God's truth. That's all it matters for Paul. He doesn't care if you die as long as you have lived according to God's will. This is what Paul's conveying to the church, to the current church. And I'm sure he's conveying this to all of us. He's saying this, that this is not, do, it's not doing his for his own achievement, whatever they were accusing him for. He just wants to demonstrate that Christ lives in him. That's why in the beginning he said, I'm opening my heart. So you can see that my motive is not something that I, for myself. To be honest with you, it's for you. He even said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 of the first letter, he said, be followers of me because I am following Christ. Christ is everything for Paul. For Paul, that's all what life is. Nothing else to live for Christ. This is what compelled Paul. What about us? What is our motivation? Why do we go to church? Why do we serve? Are we compelled? The way Paul sees and understands this? He said, he even said, in Philippians chapter 3 of 14, he says, I press on toward the goal, which is the price of the outward goal of God in Christ Jesus. That's his target. That's his goal, to get the price. For what? For who? For God in Christ. All he ever wanted was to be like Christ. That was his goal in Christ. That's enough for him. This is what compelled him. What about us? Are we still living for ourselves? And I will co conclude this message with this story. In 1858, Francis Ridley Hubbergall visited Germany with her father who was getting treatment for his afflicted eyes. While in a pastor's home, she saw a picture of the crucifixion on the wall with the words under it, I did this for thee. What hast thou done for me? Quickly, she took a piece of paper and wrote a poem based on that motto. But she was not satisfied with it, so she threw it, she threw the paper into the fireplace. The paper came out unharmed, 
Later, her father encouraged her to publish it. And now, churches are now singing it to the tune composed by Philip Bliss. And here is the, uh, I don't know how to sing this. This is an old song from the, one of the hymns. It says, but if you read this, this is not a song for Christ. This is something that Christ himself is singing for us. Listen to this. I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed. That thou mightst ransom me. And quicken from the dead. I gave. I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful.